Lumini and Jasmine St. Clair are here right now. How are you guys doing today? Hi. Hello. Hi, thank you. How's it going? It's going pretty good. It's going pretty good. Cool. Good. Cool. Cool. Glad to finally get here. Are they in the studio? They're in the studio. Yeah. Wow. We made the trip up to New York. So they've been in the studio it. before we have. Yeah. How about that? It's nice up here. How's the studio? Oh, it's nice. Very, very nice. They gave us some baseball yeah, caps, too. I'm going to be in the studio <laughs> next week, Thursday and we Friday. They gave us all the IATA gimmicks, yeah. so we're all happy. So. <laughs> cool. Sweet. What are, what are you guys... Um, what are you guys doing? <laughs> well, a few things. As far as wrestling goes right now, I mean... Well, wrestling, um, um, with the ECW situation, we're just trying to keep busy, you know, doing the personal appearances and trying to do some indie work and right. stuff like that. You know, just trying to keep sane. So, <laughs> keep our feet on the ground and uh, we'll see where the ECW situation goes. And I'm still training and whatnot with uh, Amanda Guerrero and I'm just looking at, uh, you know, some other mainstream projects on the other end. Have you... So, I mean, I don't know if Mondo Guerrero is affiliated with anything, but if you, what are your thoughts as far as, like, the, the women of wrestling thing? Me? Did, have you, were, you, were you approached, or were you, did you, would you even care um, to do something like that? Quite frankly, no. Uh, I mean, I think it's a great promotion. I actually had a friend that was with Glow a long time ago. Um, I think it's a great promotion and everything, but it's not where I would like to be. I, I've seen the show. We, find, we get the show in Philadelphia. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, the production's great and all that, and... But other than that, you know, it's it's just pretty much yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Pretty, it's pretty much glow and you know, yeah. all that shtick. So it's like yeah, it's campy. Kind but Mon is a great instructor, and I love learning from him, and I intend to keep learning as much more as I can. Oh, Mondo's great. Yeah. So, so your your goal basically is to be mainstream women wrestler then. Ultimate, exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when when um, a uh, blue meanie when. You've actually been around for how many years have you been around? Six you've been in the independent scene for for many years before you know you kind of hooked up with ECW, where people kind of heard of you from the first time. A lot of people. Yeah, uh, I started out with uh, Al Snow in was it April of '94, and I had my first match in June, and then uh, I just moved back home to the East Coast and started doing all the East Coast Indies, and uh, that's where I met up with Raven and uh, Stevie Richards on the indie show in Pittsburgh for Steel City, and uh, they had an idea for a sidekick. For Stevie, but uh, the guy that had it in mind wasn't a wrestler and he couldn't do anything really. So they needed this really big guy to, you know, wear Stevie's outfit, the half shirt, the Daisy Dukes. And at the time, you know, I, w I really didn't have a gimmick and I was just looking for a break. And I said, sure, I'll do it, you know, do whatever. And actually, I'm luck luckily it took off, you know. So was the Blue Meanie gimmick your idea or Stevie's? The, the Blue Meanie gimmick was Raven's because, uh, <laughs> A couple of weeks before, he had just watched the movie The Yellow Submarine. And yeah, from the Beatles, yeah. Yeah, he's like, oh, I got this great idea, kid. You'll love it. You know, you'll want to paint your whole body blue, kid. <laughs> ah. and I love Scotty, and he, he, he's a great, he has the best mind in his business. And at first, you know, you're kind of gun shy because you don't know what you're getting into. And then I actually went ahead and dyed my hair blue and... The rest of me, you know, is pretty much me. The whole character, you know, is an extension of myself. I mean, because I was always a class clown in school anyway, so I mean, you know, half the stuff I did was just being me. What are your thoughts as far as, like, the whole thing of, um, you kind of had that popular cult thing in yeah. ECW. You went to the WWF, and, you know, I mean, obviously they brought you in because somebody thought you were really funny in ECW. Yeah, it was, uh... And, and they gave you a couple of things, and then they kind of stopped giving you stuff. Told you to, to lose weight. Yeah. You, you probably lost more weight than, certainly than the big show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I was just wondering that because, I mean, nothing, I like, you know, Paul White and all that, but, uh. He does I, look fat, doesn't he? Yeah. I lost uh, about 150 pounds. I they say he did too, but except he put it on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. he got the, the catering. changed. Yeah, he went to catering at the TVs and, you know, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I did every. I got initially approached by uh, Al Snow. He, he, he said Vince Russo was interested in bringing me in. He was interested in bringing me and Stevie in, and but uh, Stevie had a problem with his neck injury, and they were a little bit gun shy because they thought he was going to be a liability if you know something happens with his neck again. And uh, they said, "Would you like to come in? You know, here's the idea for the job squad." I said, "Sure." And I came in, did the thing with the job squad, and then some reason the job squad got disbanded and uh, I was kind of with Al and then I was kind of on my own and then 
I was doing the angle with gold dust where gold dust stole the head, and I brought the idea of, you know, blue dust. When I do blue dust, you know, since I did it in ECW and, you know, try to get revenge for Al, and then I got, you know, my character got married with gold dust. And then um, the thing that really went downhill is, like, after, I mean, I had a good run with gold dust, and then gold dust asked for his release and uh, went to WCW, and, I mean, they pretty much had nothing for me. I mean, they, I wasn't a WWF created character, so it was kind of hard to see, you know, where to take me, you know. I wasn't a Vince McMahon brainchild, you know. I wasn't one of his ideas, so, you know, what do we do with Blue and Me? I don't know. Let's do the stuff that we came up with first, you know. That's that's how I kind of took it, you know. Plus, along with the weight, and they wanted me to lose the weight, so, okay. They Jim Ross came to me. He was like, you know, did you ever think about losing a couple pounds? And at the time... In ECW, I, I, not, I didn't know what a talent, you know, had a, you know, talent relations was. I didn't know what a road agent was. You know, I only they had them there. Pardon? <laughs> oh, I didn't know. I didn't know. I thought he was talking, you know, Jim Ross to Brian. I was like, okay, you know, I'll, I'll take into consideration. And then I come back and from the uh, tour in Germany, WrestleMania weekend, they're like, oh, well, maybe if you come back with a whole new coat of paint on you, you know, wink, wink, lose weight, you know, we'll... Uh, you know, maybe we'll take you back, but we have nothing for you now. And then the uh, the internet came, campaign started up, and uh, a couple of the people in the locker room went to bat for me, and they brought me back. This is it's nothing to do with you guys, but this is to do with a murder case that we've been talking about from Adam Bonin, who is a uh, a lawyer from Philadelphia, who says for first degree murder, premeditation need, means you need only to only take a moment before the action takes place. So it can't, you know, you don't have to like get up and say I'm going to kill this guy. You just have to, for a moment, form an intent to kill. And as Brian said, you don't have to have plotted it. Under Florida law, first degree murder is when the perpetrated from a premeditated design to the effect to affect the death of a person killed in any or any human being. Okay, so uh, anyway, that's that. I didn't even, I, I don't even understand that. Brian, do you understand that? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, this is uh, someone who goes. It's about something you also said, Brian. Um, Brian Alvarez, not Brian Heffern. Uh, heavyweight gauntlet match with who? Scott Steiner, Jeff Jarrett, Hawk. Hey, Hawk's not in the company, guys. Uh, DDP, uh, Big Daddy, Slow Motion, Nash. Give me a break. That's the problem is those guys. So, yeah, but yeah. you had to pick the five worst guys you could think of. No, Jarrett and Steiner aren't the five worst there. guys. Lance Storm, Jarrett's Mike Awesome. Okay. There's guys. Yeah, Jarrett's not bad. Yeah. Have, wasn't that great last night, but... You know, he's a good wrestler. Um, okay, so uh, Brian Heffron, when we left, when we last left off, we were talking about ranch. you were okay. So they they had let you go, yeah. And then there was the big internet campaign. So I think is he the only guy that the internet has actually gotten a job back for? I was just thinking that the other day when they were starting the campaign for uh, God, who was it? Somebody got fired and they're starting a campaign. This one, right? Yeah, I mean, there was this a Viscera campaign. There was a new one though, just a couple of days ago. And I thought, has this ever brought anybody back? And yes, it did. It was, it was, I, I don't think it ever will again, though. But anyway, go, yeah? From what I was told, uh, I came back and I was talking to Vince Russo. He kind of pulled me aside and he said that the WWW, I mean, yeah, not, the WWF's email banks were totally inundated with emails from people just writing to bring me back. I'm not, so that kind of like floored me because I, you know, I was just like, okay, I'm going. I'll just figure something else out. And I wasn't expecting to come back. But you know, it, they they went nuts. So I was like, great. Do you know? Do you know who also may have gotten back in somewhat because of that? Not entirely. Was that Jim Ross's announcer on Raw? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I remember that. Because because I mean, you know, you, it was it was very obvious during that period after he had the Bell's palsy the second time, and they did those angles with Steve Williams that I mean, they were trying to you know ride him off into the sunset as this you know like embittered you know psycho that you know. <laughs> the things that, you know what I mean? I mean, they they couldn't have portrayed him worse. And then three weeks later, he's just Jim Ross doing announcing again. Mm -hmm. That that was quite quite interesting. So so they brought you back and sent you to Memphis. And and at that point, did they kind of say like, okay, you know, lose some weight, or or how did that? I, I came back and then um, they I had a little run with Stevie because they brought Stevie in, and then me and Stevie had a little angle, and then we went on with the. Uh, Blonde Bitch Project, which pretty much went all of one segment. <laughs> and yeah, I remember that. that they, they, it was like a, a Sable deal, like, and, and then I think they just, 
I think they got scared anymore. I think they got scared because they just had the the uh, lawsuit with Sable at the time, and they didn't want to you know keep you know stirring the pot. So, I mean, because at the end of the at the video, uh, at the end of the whole skit, you know, you see Stevie in Sable's cat suit. You know, you want to do the grind and all this stuff, and I do the gimmick from Blair Witch Project where you go, no, no, Stevie, and I drop the camera and all that stuff and run off. So, I I guess that's pretty much you know why they dropped it, dropped that one. So. And then, uh, so then, then basically the Memphis thing came, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, Memphis was cool. I mean, I, I was, per- they sent, they, I did the Survivor Series angle with the uh, big show and, you know, where I was supposed to be in and they beat me and, um, kind of tie up. And then the next TVs, they're like, oh, we don't need anything for this week. Uh, we'll, we'll give you a call. So I never got the call. So, I mean, I'm just sitting at home and then they're like, you know, I, they started up the Memphis thing, and I went down there, and I mean it was a whole weird situation because you know it's just I wanted to go, I wanted to do something, but the whole idea of you know Memphis wrestling you know is pretty much a dead issue. I mean, I mean Rock Memphis was great in the 80s, early 90s, but I mean people in Memphis don't want to you know I mean nothing against the locals they don't want to see the locals they want to see the you know the Raw is War the Smackdowns and all that stuff I mean they've seen the same thing every week on Saturday morning TV I mean my first TV down there from Memphis they only drew about 20 people I mean so I mean how exciting I mean could it you know be you know you know to want to you know do anything when there's only like 20 people in the seats so now, were you, you were you were working for Terry Golden? You didn't work for Randy Hales, or did you work for both? No, Terry was a great guy. I loved working for Terry. Terry, uh, yeah, I worked for Terry Golden. He used to have his own promotion, uh, KAW, Kick-Ass Wrestling. And, I mean, he's got a great mind for wrestling, but, I mean, just the area, Mem- I mean, the Memphis itself is just burnt out. I mean, you can send people there all you want, but, I mean, it's not going to bring people out. I mean, it wasn't Terry's fault. I mean, he has a great mind. He had a, His TV show was well, very well produced. Him and David Jeff put on a incredible TV show. But, I mean, just Memphis is dead, I mean, as far as the territory. I mean, the best thing I would think to do is move a, a territory to the Northeast. I mean, the Northeast has plenty of wrestlers. And, I mean, I think it would draw very well in the Northeast. I mean, especially with guys like Donnie B running up here who draw very well-run independent shows. Now, how did you two hook up? Was that, where, where, where was that? Um, it was originally at a show in New Jersey, an indie show. Well, we met the year before that. It was a, a slash yeah. rock show. Slash wrestling, and it was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and we met there. Um, but I was busy with a bunch of other things that day, a bunch of other agendas. She, yeah, she was doing her uh, merchandise. She had her own table set up. Yeah. But she also participated in the wrestling part. I worked show. with Gilbert that day. Yeah. yeah. Came out with uh, Gilbert versus Doink, and I wrestled uh, <laughs> some local guy. I can't remember his name right. offhand. So, and yeah. then we met again back in March. Same promoter, but just a different location. And I did an even gang match with Missy Hyatt. And then I came out later on with uh, some indie worker. Yeah, the uh, the funny thing is, I mean, she was interested in me back in July, but, you know, we were busy doing our own deals and stuff like that. And March came around, we actually got a chance to talk, and, you know, we hit it off. And then uh, I found out, you know, she was very serious in the getting into wrestling, and she was training with Sue Sex. And then... Yeah, I was training with Sue back at that time, and I, st- I actually grew up watching wrestling. And my favorite wrestlers were like Sherry Martell, Sue Sexton, Medusa, Luna, I mean, I love Luna. I think she's, I, I thought she was really very talented. And um, Sherry Martel, I adored. And uh, not only was she beautiful, but she was extremely talented. And, uh, you know, I decided back in February or January of last year, this is what I want to do. So I did some independent shows. Um, I did a few for AWA and just some other small local promotions here and there. And uh, then I worked in March, and that's when I met Nini again. Yeah. And then we did hit it I off. didn't even recognize you, by the way. Yeah, she. Because I'd, I'd lost all the weight by that time, and. Uh, and I mean, you cut your hair off. Yeah, I chopped my hair off. I got rid of the yeah. mohawk po- slash ponytail, and then. Uh, all right. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't call it a mullet, but. Okay, whatever. She threw me off with the mullet reference. So, so what did you do as far as losing all the weight? Uh. It was half my own wanting to lose the weight, and then uh, Kevin Kelly 
referred me to John Warrington, who was Headbanger Masha's brother, and uh, he, he has his own little company in New Jersey, and he's, he's very, very knowledgeable about the human body. I mean, uh, and he has his own line of products, and he, he put me on a specific diet. Uh, mostly it's high protein to low carbs. It's not exactly the Atkins diet. I mean, you still take in a, you need, your body needs a certain amount of carbs and a certain amount of protein and just balancing out and weaning your calories down throughout the day and taking the vitamins, the fat burners, all that good stuff and hitting the gym, which is, you know, something I, I really need to do. I mean, growing up, I had the asthma and stuff like that, so I was kind of shy. I, I wasn't, wasn't that athletic and, you know, being not athletic and not being the best player in school, you kind of get picked on by the other kids. So you get shy away and you, you know, kind of get a little bit, you know, bummed out about it. So when you get bummed out and depressed, you, you know, start eating. So then I start putting on weight as a kid. So I was, un I was fat, unathletic, and all that good stuff. And then um, the time came where I said, you know, this is enough. I need to lose this weight. I need to get in shape. And John is a great motivator, and he's the one who, you know, lit the fire under my ass. And he, with him, I lost uh, 150 pounds. Has it helped your asthma, too? Yeah. Um, as a kid, I was like the boy in a bubble kind of thing. Uh, the, my story's been in a couple magazines where they show me an oxygen tent and all that. And I found the right doctors, you know, uh, growing up, and a doctor in, out in Morgate, New Jersey. I don't know if he's still there, uh, Dr. Altamarino. And he... Got me on the right medications. I had the little machine at home where I took my medicine every day. I took my pills and all that stuff. And eventually, I, I grew out of it. I mean, I still have complications, but it's mostly just from allergies and stuff like that. And change of season, like the fall, fall, and then spring, and you know, with all the pollen there, uh, that's when I get bad. But other than that, my asthma's been fine. And I mean, the w weight loss, you know, certainly helped. That's cool. Yeah. Now, now, a, a lot of people that drop a lot of weight. A lot of times, you know, they start having trouble keeping it off, and it kind of comes back. Yeah. Now, what? Uh, you haven't had, you really haven't had that problem, have you? If anything, um, I maintain. Like, if I hit the plateau, I'll just like stay at the same weight and just you know coast, and then that's when John will take me and uh, he'll uh, totally readjust what I've been doing, and you know, throw a little bit of something different here and there, and just to shock my body again, and my body, you know, starts reacting to it so the, the, the only problem i've had with the weight loss so far is you know losing all that weight you kind of you know get the extra skin and stuff like that so i'm just waiting for that to you know snap back and you know i don't have as much cushion you know when i take the bumps now so that you know you kind of feel them a little bit more and my knees are a little bit more sore in my back because you know the pressure's down so i'm adjusting and that's why me and you know jasmine have been going to uh mondo you know for her to you know, progress in the wrestling, and then me to you know get adjusted to working at this weight. You know, and try some doing some new stuff. You know, do you think it's harder for a woman in wrestling as far as the look required, or for a guy? What do you two think? I think it varies. I mean, no, I don't think so at all. I mean, I've seen different looks on different girls in wrestling. You know. I mean, uh, with, you know, the women, I mean, they look for the, you know, a different aspect as part yeah. of the guys. I mean, with the guys, they, uh, well, I noticed in the WWF, you got to lose, you know, you, you can't be overweight. You, they like guys who are, you know, well built from the chest up. You know, you got to have the big shoulders that, you know, flare out the big chest. And they actually, you know, believe it or not, they look at, you know, your skin, you know, you know does he, have, you know, take care of his skin and all that stuff, you know, you know. It's just totally weird how they do it, but, I mean, these are little things they look for. I mean, they want a good upper body, good skin tone, and all that stuff. Yeah. But at the same time, I mean, we can't all look the same, or else it just becomes really boring. You look like a bunch of robots. Yeah, I think everyone has to have their own identity and their own thing, something but special about each person. I, 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 you can't, I, no one can always look, can look the same. Right. What I'm thinking is, is sometimes I think that this... Especially at the top level, I think it's a lot more forgiving for guys. I mean, if a guy is, if a guy is a really good worker, he can have an average physique. But if yeah. a woman is a really good worker, um, it's it's not that it's not impossible, but it's it's tougher, I think. 
Maybe, maybe so. Yeah. Well, the w women's wrestling never really got its fair shake throughout the history, if you look at it. I mean, sometimes it was there when it was hot, like, you know, when Wendy Rector and Cindy Lauper did the big thing in the 80s, that women's wrestling was hot, and then it kind of disappeared for a little bit, and then it came back, and then you had women doing, like, Rock and Robin and stuff like that, and then it kind of disappeared again, and it, I believe it's, you know, starting to come back. I mean, all the girls are, you know... I mean, even if you're just a manager, you guys be physically able to do it somehow. To do something besides just stand around the ring like a statue. Yeah, just you know. Be, I mean, it's good to you know look good and all, but you just don't want to be a piece of furniture just standing there, you know, waiting for your cue to enter the ring and exit the ring. You know, I mean, you got to do something. To, you know, the. I mean, to at least earn your spot there. I think you know. Did you do any other sports when you were younger, Jasmine? Oh, uh, definitely, most definitely, actually. Um, when I was watching the wrestling growing up, I wanted to take wrestling classes, but that wasn't available. I went to private schools around New York City, and the only thing that was offered to me was modern dance, jazz, ballet. I took those, and I did kickboxing, and I still take kickboxing, um, and soccer. I like soccer. This is someone who has an idea for some new sitcoms starring WCW wrestlers. Uh, Dukes of Hazardous Ratings, starring Jeff Jarrett. Every week, Jarrett drives away the audience in a high-speed chase. Time Traveler, starring Hulk Hogan. Every week, Hogan travels back in time to the days when he was a star. Unfortunately, the audience doesn't travel back in time with him. <laughs> Kung Fu, The Slowest Generation, starring Kevin Nash, who takes David Carradine's slow-motion fighting and running to new, even slower levels. Delirious, starring Eric Bischoff, CEO of a company in debt and going out of business. Bischoff comes up with new screwy ideas every week to save it. The Man Who Knows No Shame, starring Ric Flair. A down-in-his-luck insanity, former wrestling superstar tries to regain his popularity by doing angles that no other wrestler would humiliate himself by doing. Well, I'm going to get a lot of heat for just reading this one. The Invisible Cameraman. A cameraman accidentally drinks a potion that makes him invisible to workers backstage at a wrestling show and is able to share with all the television audience all the boring backstage antics. Kind of like oh, GTV. Yeah. WCW I think all the cameramen are invisible right now, aren't they? Yes, pretty much. Uh, WCW Nitro, an all-star cast, attempts to put on a wrestling TV show every week that flops. Salvador Dali Jr., starring Vince Russo. Russo plays the son of a legendary, sur of a s legendary surrealistic painter who, after having inherited his dad's surrealistic mind, gets a job as a wrestling show writer, leaving, his, leaving the paltry audience guessing as to the meaning of his scripts. Mean Gene, starring Gene Okerlund. Gene Okerlund plays a modern-day clueless Mr. Magoo. And The Mothership, starring Dusty Rhodes. Dusty and his wacky flying saucer travel the universe in search of pizza. Some of them were funny. Not all of them were. Uh, let's see. What's, there's one other one that I was going to read here. Um, but this is actually for uh, Brian, Brian Heffern, who goes, um, how do you feel about the uh, how the WF used you, and how do you feel about the RTC gimmick that Stevie is using? Um, I mean, I, I just felt fortunate enough to even you know make it to the WWF. I mean, let, let alone just be in wrestling. You know, let alone go to the WWF. I mean, I mean, when I told my you know family and friends I'm going to grow up, I, I, my whole life I said I want to be a professional wrestler. They're like, you're nuts. I mean, because I couldn't climb a flight of stairs without turning you know purple or blue in the face because of the asthma and the weight. So I mean, I mean, I had fun. The, the best stuff I did there was with Goldust. I mean, there's a lot of stuff we did on the air that was good, and there's like even better stuff we did off the air that. You know, they, they, I mean, there was a lot of great stuff we did that didn't there, especially when they, uh, we did the whole, you know, Goldust is my mommy thing and the promo we did for it, TV blacked out and you know, nobody got to see it. So, but then they never followed up. I mean, I can't complain. I really had a great time there. I loved working there. If they asked me to go back, I'd, you know, I'd love to go back because I mean, I know I have a lot of friends there. A lot of great people are there. They're very great to work for, but. uh you know, I'm on to a different part of my career now, and we'll see where it goes, especially with the ECW situation. Hopefully, you know, we'll see what, where that takes us. As far as uh, Stevie's new gimmick, I think it's cool. I mean, uh, it took me a little while to adjust seeing him without the, the long hair and all that stuff like that. And But it kind of, to me, it kind of has, like, you know, shelf life written all over it. I mean, uh, oh, yeah. I mean, the PTC thing with the WWF, you know, I mean, you know that's you know it's good you know to poke you know poke fun at that but I mean what if the you know PTC stops you know 
bickering with the WWF. I mean, then where does Daniel go from there? I mean, it's it's just too much shelf life for it. And it's, it's too 80s kind of, you know, wrestling for me. I mean... I IRS, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, it might sound funny coming from me, the guy who wore the, the half shirt and the Daisy Dukes and the raccoon glasses for, you know, five years. But, I mean, it's kind of it's kind of too, you know... 80s, 80-ish. You know, it's not against Stevie. I'm, I'm glad he's got a spot. You know, he's doing a hell of a job with it. I mean, he took the ball and he ran with it. But, I mean, just, you know. What are your thoughts on ECW right now? I know there's some guys that they kind of, they'll admit that there's some major problems and there are other guys that kind of are like, you know, it's fine. Paul, figure something out. Yeah, I mean, Paul will figure something out. I mean, look at, I mean, Paul Lee could sell a you know, catch up popsicles to a busload of nuns. I mean, he can sell anybody on anything. I mean, he's not being able to sell. <laughs> uh, I mean, so this one no. though. I know, I know, I know. But the, the whole TNN thing really screwed ECW over. I mean, when, with all the uh, concessions they were supposed to get, you know that you know TNN didn't hold up to their end of the bargain, and you know then they you know canceled us and went to WWF and gave them gave WWF all the access we were supposed to get. I mean. I mean, in the long run, I mean, it looked good, you know, because we, we had all this access, like MTV, Howard Stern, all this stuff. And then, you know, we can, you know, do whatever with advertising and, you know, make money back then. But ECW is way, spending way too much in production and getting, you know, nothing back from TNN. But now, I mean, ECW is great. I mean, it's young. It's it's fresh. I mean, I mean, you got a lot of guys who are willing to do anything just to, you know, entertain the crowd. I mean, and there's really no, there's no egos. I mean, people are willing to do whatever it takes, you know, to get the, you know, company over. It's not, you know, it's, there's no one person, you know, if, if you want to say that. So I think where ECW is going, I mean, Paulie's not going to let it die. I mean, it's, it's his child. He took it from... I mean, the company started off bribing the fans, you know, with hot dog and beer to come to their TV tapings, and then they went to, you know, national pay-per-view. I mean, he, he he took this child and raised it, and, you know, it's going to be a new chapter in the career where, you know, he sends his kid to college if he has to sell it. I mean, if he sells it, you know, great. I mean, but he, we need TV, too. So, I mean, I, I see yeah. I, I see it picking up. I don't see Paulie letting it die. I mean he he's fought too long and too hard for this and I mean the, he wouldn't he wouldn't let his you know only child you know just fade away like that. The well, let's go let's go to the calls. We're gonna start with Brad in Philadelphia. Brad, what's going on? How you doing? Hey, what's, what's up, man? Hi. Uh, I have two questions. One for Meany and uh, one for Dave. Uh, Dave, first of all, I want to know what do you think about the, about this trial? Um, do you think maybe Part of the reason with uh, these kind of uh, circumstances where kids are killed with doing wrestling moves is that uh, the media portrays it that it's fake and they tell everyone that it's fake and so kids do the moves thinking it's fake, you can't get hurt, and then someone goes and dies because they do it for real, not realizing that people really do get slammed, people really do fall. I don't, I mean, ever, you know, it's not just the media. I mean, like, you know, Vince McMahon's out there saying the same thing, but um, I, I think that, like, when it comes to a 13 year old, I mean, you're when you're 13 years old, you know enough that I mean, the injuries that this little girl had, like lacerated liver. I mean, like the injuries were a mile long. She, you know, that was so so brutal. And when you're 13, you know enough not to be brutal. And you, whether you see something on wrestling or not, I, I, I don't, I don't, you know, whether he was imitating wrestling or not imitating wrestling, I don't see that as any kind of a defense for for anything anyway. Uh, by the time you're old enough to lift somebody up and put him in a dangerous position, you should know. I mean, I mean there's, there's more things there's, out there than the wrestling, too. I mean, you got all these, you know, videos on MTV where people shoot each other and stuff like that. I mean, But what about how they're raised? I mean, 13 years of raising someone has way more influence than, like, a few days or a few weeks or a few months of watching wrestling. I mean, where's the back time to watch it? I mean, you know, I, yeah. I watched wrestling from, you know, we all did. We all watched wrestling from yeah. when we were a little yeah. kid, and I don't think any of us ever... You know, considered beating anyone's death, <laughs> or, or or even in, or even in a situation where you kind of like hit someone. I mean, you know that, you know, you know. I mean, even when you're like eight years old, you know, if you've ever been hit or hit someone, you know, like as a little kid, you get hit, you cry, and it's sort of like, okay, you know, we don't want to do that anymore. You know what I mean? It's like, so so to beat, you know. Um, there, I mean, there's the one. I mean, there's different cases. There was the one in Dallas where 
I mean, it was like a little kid who was playing with their, like, I forget it was, like an infant or something, and threw like a, a flying clothesline. And I think that the, when landing, hit, hit it hit on the table, which was a freak accident. But they were imitating wrestling. But, you know, you could have... Whereas the parents... You know, it's, it, it's like a... It's like things are going to happen if, in, in, a, in a universe of of so many people in this country, whatever it is, 250 million, there are going to be incidences. There are going to be some incidences out there. And um, if they're not, I mean, if they're frequent, like if we heard about 50 in a year, I would be alarmed. But for, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what that what that really means in the whole grand scheme of things anyway. I mean, we all did the... I don't, I don't know. It's, 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 it's a tough subject. But in this specific case, he was a wrestling fan, but, you know, if, to, to me, whether he was and whether whether he actually used moves that he learned while watching wrestling or moves that he learned while watching football or Ultimate Fight or whatever, and this girl was beaten to death, you know, he, that that doesn't absolve anyone of any guilt to me. I mean, uh, I did the backyard. I mean, everybody grew up watching wrestling. You know, I've been watching since I was six years old. And, you know, I broke every piece of furniture in my house, you know, you know, doing the super fly Jimmy Schnooka splash off the, you know, dresser onto my teddy bear. But, I mean, when I threw a punch at my friend, we were playing wrestling, the, the, you know, the punches missed by a mile. I mean, I mean, we knew it was a work, you know, I mean, because, I mean, at six years old, you're like, oh, okay, it's real, blah, blah, blah. And then it's pretty much like, you know, finding out there's no Santa Claus. I mean, you find out it's a work. I mean, if you can't, it's... It's, 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 and I, we all did the backyard wrestling, you know, you know it's a work, and just to say, blame wrestling, I mean, when there's a lot worse things out there on TV, you know, it's just ridiculous. I mean, when the whole business came out and said, okay, we're at work, woohoo, you know, I mean, I think it's ridiculous. Plus the whole thing with classifying something as a wrestling move, you know, yeah. if somebody falls down or gets tackled, you, you know, you call it a football tackle, do you call it a spear? I mean, it's not necessarily a wrestling, take- a wrestling move. Is it a wrestling takedown? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, my other question is uh, for Meany. Uh, what do you think about the fact that you were sent down to Memphis and then eventually let go, uh, and then they sent the big show to Ohio Valley, and he was told to lose weight, and they bring him back, put him in a prominent role, and he's twice as big as when he left? <laughs> well, they got the good cooking down south, so, you know, so. But, uh, I mean... They sent me to Memphis. I was like, okay, I'm a team player. You know, I just want to work. I just want to, you know, have fun, earn a living, and I just want to be in the business. You know, you know, call me a mark. Ooh, but I mean, everybody in the business is a mark for the business. You know, if you're not, then you wouldn't be in it. But yeah, I was okay. I'll go to Memphis. You know, I had to, you know, relocate within two weeks and all that stuff. And I was coming home here and there. You know, you know, to visit the family, and take care of everything I had to do because you know, I was paying double rent, I was paying double bills, and I still take care of my mom and my grandma. And then when I came home in April, March or April, uh, my grandma's health took a turn for the worst, and I debated. I mean, I, I was leaving to go back to Memphis, and I woke my grandma up to say goodbye. I mean, she could barely move, and I, I felt like such a heel leaving her in that condition. I mean, what person in the right mind? would leave their grandma like that, you know, when, you know, I'm the only person that helps me do any physical labor. So I went back down to Memphis that day, and I, I thought it over, well thought it over from the cab right to the airport, the flight home, going to the TV tapings, what, you know, if I should ask to go home and take care of my family. I get to the TV tapings, and I, you know, pull Bruce Pritchard aside and said, you know, Bruce, my grandma's very sick. You know, I'd like to go home and take care of her. I'm the only person in this house who can do anything, you know, physical, go to the store, you know, do laundry, all that stuff. You know, I, I, I have to be there for her. And he's very understanding. He said, you know, go home, take care of your family. I was like, hey, you know, even if I, I could work for Paul, you know, and, you know, you just guys see the TV every week and see how I'm doing. He said, fine. And he called Paulie, and Paulie said, you know, I could work there. And then I got the, uh, I, I went home, and then, you know, ECLB was having a little bit of trouble. I couldn't come right in right away. And then my grandma's health took an even worse turn. I, you know, I had to put her in. We had to take her to the hospital. She was in intensive care. I came home from visiting her in intensive care. And you know, that's when I got the call to be released. I mean, I, I mean, I, I did everything I was asked for. And I lost, you know, they want me to lose weight. I lost 150 pounds and all that stuff. All I ever asked for is, you know, to spend the last couple months of my grandmom's life with her. I mean, I mean, if that's too much to ask, I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, it kind of bugs me a little. I don't know. 
So I, I lost the weight, and then, you know, I'm just here. <laughs> I'm in ECW. They gave me my release. Okay, I'll just go on to whatever. But uh, So now, were you, were you, when they gave you the release, had you started with ECW, or what was the timeline of that? Uh, I got released, I'd like to say either July, maybe? June, July? No, then it was June. It was definitely <laughs> June because uh, I'm just trying to remember the timeline. It was June, and then uh, we gave Paulie a call, and then Paulie had the idea for, you know, me and Jasmine with the Blue Boy thing, you know, how I lost all the weight, and I'm all cocky and arrogant, and you know, I got the hot girlfriend and, you know, and everything like that. And we said, sure. You know, I mean, we were talking, we were talking to WCW at the time, but, uh, I mean, just, it just felt right, you know, to go to ECW. I mean, it's way, you know, you go by instinct, and my instinct said, you know, go to Paul. I mean, we really liked the ideas he had. He's very but, well, For you, as far as, like, ideas and stuff, that would be the place to go, because if you had gone to WCW, I mean, it's not like they were going to have any ideas. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, I mean, Vince Russo wanted to bring us into WCW, and... I was a little bit gun shy because I think another reason why I was released from WWF is because Vince Russo signed me and then he took off for WCW and you know when they review your papers you know well you know they blew me. oh Vince Russo signed him ah you know so and then you know he was on the outs with WCW at the time and I didn't want you know the double kiss of death you know I mean if I mean if God forbid anything happened and, and Vince left and they review oh who hired the Blue and Jasmine Sinclair. Ah, Vince Russo hired him. You know, I didn't want you know the double double whammy, you know, and then you know I'd, I'd be getting fired soon. I don't know. So, anything else, Brad? No, that's about it. Okay, thanks a bunch. All right, let's go to Ryan in Wisconsin. Ryan, what's going on? Hey, how's it going, everybody? Hey. Um, first, I want to thank Dave. <laughs> my um, I sent some email comments in last night, and you actually posted them on your website, or I don't know if you did or. About um, how to help out WCW, but thanks uh, for posting I put it up those. there. Yeah, you you spent oh, a lot of time big working one. on that. The, the, big, the real the real big one. You get yeah. Starcade booked. I think you put more thought in that company than anyone in that company put together. I'd actually been working on it for for a while ever since. Well, it shows. <laughs> I was looking at that thing and it was like, oh my God! I mean, you really put some thought into this thing. But once, well, I don't know if Bischoff will ever look at it, but I thought I had a few good ideas, but. Um, actually, I wanted to ask Meanie and Jasmine. Um, you guys have both done the wrestling and the managers. I'd like to see, you know, which ones you guys like to do most, and do you think um, Japan would be the place for you guys, um, especially with Jasmine, since, you know, unless it was with, what, WOW or whatever is out there for the women. There's not a whole lot of women's wrestling that I know of, except for over in Japan where it's taken real seriously. I wouldn't want to work for WOW honestly or I mean I'm not putting it down or anything I think like I said before they have a great production and you know they have a really nice idea but I mean I wouldn't mind working in Japan you know if they brought both of us over there yeah I mean that'd be a lot of fun it's an experience and I just I mean I don't I don't know about this wow thing though I did the managers uh, the stint as a manager and then wrestler I like I, per I prefer the wrestling you know it's just an adrenaline rush I mean just you know to try and capture, you know, a, gr a whole bunch of people's imaginations at once and, you know, have them, you know, have the same emotional responses with the pops and the, you know, the oohs and the ahs, right. you know. I mean, I love that. And, uh, I mean, as far as Japan goes, I mean, I would love to go to Japan, but, I mean, I mean, it's, it, I, don't, I haven't really followed it all that much, so I just, I mean, I followed Japan wrestling a lot when, you know, the American wrestling has downtime in the early 90s, so I started watching a lot of Japanese stuff, and then I just faded it off into it. So I don't really know where I would fit as far as Japan goes, so. Now, Jensen, are you originally from Milwaukee? Did I read that somewhere? Never, no. Oh. I know, I was at the Milwaukee Metal Fest two years in a row. Okay. I hosted the event, and I, um, I worked with the wrestling show that was there. Um, originally from New York. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you guys ever, um, I know there's some indie promotions. I know Jerry Lynn has been doing one in Green Bay that's been right. getting some TV coverage. Have you guys been contacted by them or thought about going to, to yeah, that? There's like a half-hour show I think they produce. Uh, we, we haven't uh, been contacted by anybody in Minnesota, but, uh, I mean, we're doing indies. we got one come up March 3rd for Donnie B. If you go to his website, Big Buck Promotions, B-U-C, um, you can check that out. I mean, he runs a yeah. very well-run promotion, and I enjoy working for him each and every time. So, 
if you guys were contacted by, say, WCW or WWF, and they just wanted one of you guys, would that be a problem? I know, like, you see, like, Luger and Elizabeth, that was, like, one of their big problems as a couple that, you know, they didn't really want to be separated. Or if you both worked for the same federation, you know, they wanted Jasmine to turn on you or, or vice versa. Would you guys be comfortable doing something like that? Well, yeah, I mean, your career always comes first no matter what. I mean, I don't care what anyone says. Um, it's the bottom line. I don't hold anyone back from their career, and I don't expect it to be done to me. I mean, it's been done too many times to me before in the past where I've had some mainstream options and I was held back from it, and, you know, those days are over. So if he was contacted by WWF or WCW and he went, you know, I, I wish him the best of luck, yeah. I mean, it wouldn't affect, affect our relationship. I mean, I want Jasmine to do well in whatever she wants to do. I mean, I mean that's her, you know, if she wants It's my livelihood. Yeah, it's you your can't livelihood. You can't, from that. you can't, you know, you know, keep, you know, money out of her pocket or bread off her table. I mean, if she wanted to do that, you know, God bless her. I mean, it doesn't feel the way I, you know, change the way I feel for her, you know. I mean, we're, it'd still be cool. How would you guys, like, like if one turned on the other? Would We've done that before. Yeah, we already did yeah, that. Yeah, well, that's really cute. <laughs> yeah, I was working with uh, Kay Quick, who was Kay Crush at the time, and uh, she was my manager, and she uh, turned on me during the match. So, that was, you know, if we're in the same, you know, league and she turns on me, that's no biggie. <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. As long as Take Kevin Sullivan isn't booking. <laughs> 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 Got a couple of notes here and a couple of questions for Blue Meanie on weight loss that we're going to get to in just a second as well. Uh, XFL announced its uh, broadcast team. No, they're not holding. They announced their broadcast <laughs> teams. And uh, looking at this thing, uh, the Jim Ross, Jerry Lawler team is like on the – they got the worst – Thing, they're going to have the least exposure because they're, they're going to do four games a week. Uh, one of them is going to be on NBC in virtually every market. Then one of them will be on NBC in like two markets, which will be the two markets of the teams that are played. The B game, which is the one that Ross and Jerry Lawler and Jonathan Coachman will be the announcers for. Oh, God. Yep. So three wrestling announcers. So the main game on Saturday night, which will be the big one, Matt Vaskersian, who does those uh, TV commercials, on play-by-play, -play, Jesse Ventura as the analyst in the sideline reports will be Mike Adamley, who uh, former football player who did like American Gladiators, and Fred Rogan, who's an LA sports guy from God Fred Rogan Sports Report. Uh, let's see who used to always cover was one of the guys covering wrestling when you weren't supposed to do that, so maybe that's where he got in. NBC second game will be uh, Jim Ross, Jerry Lawler, and Jonathan Coachman. They will cut into the second game at times during the, the A game, so. When you watch the NBC game, you'll get to see, oh, and in, uh, you know, Birmingham, in front of no fans, here's uh, Jim Ross, Jerry Lawler, and Jonathan Coachman. UPN's game, which will be, uh, UPN's will be at uh, 4 o'clock uh, Eastern time on, is it Saturdays or on Sundays? So uh, that's 1 o'clock our time. So it's a, so it's, UPN will do a Saturday afternoon game that they're expecting to get a, what is it, 5.5? Was it, what were those numbers? 3.0 rate. Was it down? Didn't they just lower it? Um, I'm talking about what they're selling the ads based on. Okay. I know. No, yeah, now, now it'll be lowered, yeah. But anyway, the UPN team will be Chris Marlowe, who I remember as a very good volleyball play-by-play -play announcer, Brian Bosworth on color, uh, Michael Barkin, who I don't know, and Chris Raggy, who I also don't know, with sideline reporters, and then the TNN game, which will be... Um, wait, 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 wait. I take that back. The UPN game is Saturday. It's going to be Sunday nights at seven. The TNN game is the one that's going to air Sundays at four. So TNN's got to do a a 2.5 rating at four o'clock on Sunday afternoons. Ah, boy. Well, Sunday afternoons is football time. Well, 2.5. I don't know. We'll see. Craig Minervini, who of course used to be Craig DeGeorge in the WWF, will be doing play-by-play. -play. Bob Golick will be doing col the color. And Kip Lewis and Lee Rareman on the sidelines. Lee Rareman, of course, the Roller Jam announcer who is even more famous for being a former American Gladiator. So that's the scoop on the XFL announcing teams. Now I'll ask about <coughs> weight loss. Let me see the weight loss questions. I've got one. And then um, um, WCW.com has just said that Modest and Daniels have both been signed. I, somehow that sounds way too quick. Hmm. You know, I mean, it takes a while to process contracts. Um, I'll check on that one, but... Um, and isn't Modest, started. like, in Canada right now? Daniels. Or Daniels, Daniels. Uh, he'd have gone in Canada today, yeah. Mm-hmm. So he I don't think... on the airplane. I don't think that they're signed, but I'll find, I'll, we'll find out. 
Okay, let me see. Where were we? Um, Scott Snyder, Booker T, and Buff Bag will be on Charmed a week from today, um, 9 o'clock Eastern. And, of course, also a week from today, A&E Behind Closed Doors with John London on the Power Plant. Okay, this is from Evan Roberts who says, Pass this on to Blue Meanie. I just want to let you know that I've just lost 60 pounds, and you and Lance Storm were my big influences. Just like you might want to know that you can impact a life outside of just wrestling. You and Lance Storm. Cool. Well, I guess Lance Storm's in good shape. Yeah, I, I, I believe uh, Lance posts a lot of his uh, workout and diet tips on his website. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, that means a lot to me that, you know, somebody would actually take the time and write me and, you know, even consider what I've done and influence. I mean, to me, it was just bettering my life. And if anybody else can take a cue from that, you know, then I, I'm flattered. I mean, I get a lot of letters at my website, too, and... Uh, you know, it just means a lot to me when people actually take the time out and write to me. I mean, because it was hard for me. I mean, it was definitely hard, you know, just re-educate myself to, you know, a new way of life. And, you know, I mean, if I can, you know, just touch one person, you know, not that I'm trying to or anything, you know, just, I mean, if I can affect one person's life, then, you know. Do you have cool. a diet workout thing on your website? No, no. I mean, I get a lot of people saying I should, you know, write a book or something, but, I mean, you know, it takes you me uh, out, you know. I think the storm got a it? huge one up there. Oh, it does. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because the the thing, it's like it takes like that weird discipline because there's like, you know, like like I I used to have no problem when there was no junk food in the house because I never bought junk food, but when the junk food is actually bought for the house and it's like here and it's just laying there, it's kind of like no it, one's like, eating it. Yeah. It's just calling it's your like, name, and you know, you get yeah, bored, you're like, my name late at like midnight <laughs> when I'm hungry and I'm about to go to bed and I see all this candy. Yeah. You know, so, so that, I mean, I can go, you know, I'm pretty good disciplined with stuff, but that's like, sometimes it's, sometimes it's hard, especially if you had a bad day and you want to reward yourself. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's hard. You reward to... yourself for bad days? What? Well, yeah, because if I have a good day, I don't need to eat junk food. I'm happy. <laughs> Plus, I take certain things, like, there's, a, like, certain kind of protein shakes I take, and, like, if I drink them, like, soy milk, t- you know, it tastes like chocolate milk, so I feel like I'm cheating, so, you know, it's it's pretty cool. And then and the protein bars, you know, if they taste good enough, it feels like I'm eating candy, so, you know, it's kind of easy, so. This is from Matt, and just goes, I want to know if I could find out who the guy is who helped Lumini lose all that weight and how he can be reached. I guess that's John Warrington, right? Yeah, John Warrington, um, he's... He's in the process of working with a uh, new website. We'll plug uh, tncvitamins.com. And uh, I don't know if it's up yet, but he's so, slowly in the process of getting that done and up. And I'm going to type up a testimony for his products. And, you know, he helped me, you know, help motivate me. So if I could pass it on, you know. Okay, let's go to Mike in Philadelphia. Mike, what's going on? Oh, Mike, uh, Mike is not there anymore. Andrew in New Jersey. What's going hey, on? Hey, Dave, what's up? Not too much. How you doing, me? Hey, what's up, man? Hey, uh, I got a question. I just joined the show late, and um, this is going to sound kind of like a dumb question, but are you from New Jersey? Oh, I grew up in Jersey. Oh, that's cool, because that's where I'm from also. So. Sweet. Um, I don't know. I have a pretty good friend of mine who's looking to uh, get into pro wrestling. He's, he's huge right now. He's about 6'5", 305, 310 pounds. I was wondering if you knew any good schools in New Jersey that you might want to look into. Uh, I don't, I'm not too sure about Jersey. There's, they, they still have the Monster Factory, but I don't know how that is. But uh, there's a good school in Baltimore called Bone Breakers, run by uh, Dan McDevitt, Corporal Punishment, Mark the Shark. And, I mean, they're very good. And a lot of good guys came out of that school. And then there's a good one up in Reading, which uh, Steve Carino runs. And I, think it, I, I can't think of the name offhand. I mean, I wish I could, but, you know. Is the, um, the ECW uh, school still around? Uh, no. Uh, it was run by Taz, and then it kind of shut down after Taz left. So I'm sure hopefully once everything's up and running again, they'll have a new instructor there and get that get the ball rolling with that. All right, cool. Um, Dave, I just got one quick question for you. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been reading all over the Internet that this, that uh, Vince McMahon wants to bring back Hulk Hogan and, I was wondering, what do you think would happen if Vince did bring back Hogan? Do you think he'd do all the jobs to Stone Cold and The Rock, or do you think he'd throw a little hissy fist like he did in WCW over that? Uh, boy, it would be... He, it's not like he's going to not do the jobs. That's not the problem. Yeah. 
the problem figure is figure out a way to avoid it. Yeah. In well, a, uh, kind of like Hunter, you know. There's there's a mani- there's a manipulative thing, <clears throat> and and then the other thing is is that like there's a there's a certain thing when it comes to morale, and I mean the Big Show thing has I mean there you know I've heard the buzzing in the last two days, and uh, you know it, it all of the things that you would expect. When, you know, a lot of what happens as far as, like, morale of wrestlers, you know, if you, you can kind of sit here on the outside, and, and the stuff you expect is usually the stuff that the wrestlers themselves worry about. Like, in the WWF, they're worried about the XFL, mm-hmm. how much money the XFL yeah. is going to... If the XFL is a big loser, will it hurt their paychecks? Yeah, will it take them. Vince McMahon's time away? Mm-hmm. You know, that type of stuff. The other thing, you know, like, uh, they see the big show coming in and getting the monster push, and yeah, then yeah, those yeah. guys who who were there yeah. working hard, didn't get the push, and then, I mean, I know this isn't from Kurt Angle, because Kurt Angle himself, you know, I mean, he's very new in the business, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, you heard him on the show, he's very trusting, and, and yeah. he's been very lucky, because he's so good that he's going to, you know, he's going to be a superstar in this business, here he is, but, you know, there are guys there that kind of see that they think Kurt Angle doesn't get the, um, what's it called, the credit that he deserves, because he is so nice, so, you know, there's those little things around, um, if Hogan went there... Yeah, because I'm just thinking here, like, man, could you ever imagine Hogan just getting pinned right in the middle of the ring by a stunner or a rock bottom? Oh, he will. I, I, I think Hogan will, because he, he, he lets Sting pin him. But he'll manipulate. He, he can be really clever in manipulating in a way where it doesn't look that bad, but he'll, I mean, he's not going to not do the finishes. Yeah, I'm just like, or he's going to like also hook up after getting, like, the people's elbow and doing all that other stuff. Actually, it might be appropriate with the people's elbow, but... Plus, there's ways. I mean, you can you know go down and still you know stay strong. So I mean, I don't think I, there's no way you can you know kill kill Hulk like that. I mean. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you did a lot for the business, but. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, plus when you bring somebody into uh, somebody new into a new league or you know new federation, whatever you want to call it, I mean, you don't want to come in like right at the top because I mean, where can you go from there? I mean, mm-hmm. it's yeah, not I, like Spinal Tap where they're, you know, ants go to 11. I mean, you get, if you can only go to 10, I mean, if you come in at 10, I mean, where do you go? I mean, you want to come in. I mean, like, they brought in Jericho and slowly built him up. They're bringing in Raven. They're slowly building him up. Yeah, I, mean, like, I don't know. If they bring back Hogan. Yeah, though, if they bring in Hogan, it isn't going to be the same as Jericho and Raven. Yeah, they're going to. Oh, I'm going to do it. It'll be, in, it. it'll be in reverse. Yeah. Gonna, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean I look at how many jobs that Hogan did for Kidman and Vampiro that nobody ever remembers. Because yeah, I remember he did the one. He knew exactly how to do it. But, like, with, with yeah. all that interference and stuff, and, like... The thing the thing isn't the jobs that's the problem, but the thing is is the guys that are going to go in there. I mean, they're all going to be not trusting, but then he will charm a lot of them at the same time, because mm-hmm. if you ever notice, like, a lot of wrestlers, you know, that should know better don't when it comes to Hogan. Yeah. But the, the thing is is that there's going to be that thing. He's going to have to be... In a featured role because he's Hulk Hogan, and yeah, all of a sudden, just like having the opening role. No, well, why, why did he pay a million dollars a year to be in the opening match? Yeah, he's not going to come cheap. So, so he's got to be in a featured role. And then the thing is, okay, now what do you do? If you put him in there with a Rock and Stone Cold, you're not going to have the main event quality that we're used to. Oh, so no, that's got to be like, taken <laughs> into consideration. If you feud him with Vince McMahon, nobody expects a good match, so that's okay. They could probably deliver a better match than people expect, and everyone's happy, and they yeah, can do the interviews back and forth. Or you know, but they'll, they'll they'll get through it. They'll get through it. But the thing is, is like, I don't know that you would. I don't think Vince McMahon would want to bring him in and have him out there, you know, with Hunter yeah. and with Rock and with uh, Stone Cold and those people in main events. I think that the right role for Hogan is is probably to, you know, work in more of a comedy role in the middle yeah. and just take take advantage of his name value and 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 things like that. So, yeah. um, but but will Hogan again? Will Hogan want to come in and not be at the top? When he can go to WCW and, and run just everything. Be over everybody I mean, and get the world title at the snap of his fingers. Yeah, maybe getting it sooner than you think. <laughs> WCW wouldn't. Although Bischoff says he knows better now, but <laughs> hey, time will tell. Time will tell. Yeah. I don't know. All right, well, thanks. Okay, you're very welcome. Take care. Okay. Um, Jasmine. Huh? What Have, have you encountered um, any problems as far as wrestling as far as just because of your background, or has it just no. been something that no one's really brought brought up? No, not at all. I mean, because I did the right thing. You know, I was serious enough to leave that behind me. And, you know, quite frankly, I mean, no one's ever really brought it up because it's forgotten. And 
quite frankly, I mean, I'm in a job now where I could actually say this is the first job I've ever had in my entire life that I love, and I love the people that I work with. Everything in the past to me that was in my past in that era that you're referring to was a joke, and, you know, I just got sick of dealing with moronic, irresponsible people, if that's what you want to call them, <laughs> you know. No. I, I don't like dealing with people that are out of touch with reality and just live in their own delusional world. Whoa. That's Whoa. true. <laughs> not only did she burn the bridge to that past, she blew it but up. But why would I care? I mean, that's not even a real, it's nothing. No. It's like a joke. <laughs> right, you know. I think um, people in, uh, well, I don't know. Well, honestly, people in wrestling are pretty delusional, but yeah, uh, but this is different. I mean, this is—it's mainstream. It's real. I mean, it's a great place to be. I mean, the people here are great, and I, I love it here. To be honest with you, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, me, uh, we, um, you, you, you grew up in Jersey, but the first I remember, God, the first I remember of you is like out of Michigan. Yeah. How did you hook up without snows without snow? Um, when I was in high school. Uh, when I was reading the Observer Weekly, uh, they used to have the uh, thing where people would send in their uh, plugs and requests, and there was a request for uh, Malenko School. And then uh, I sent a letter. You know, I was sending out feelers, you know, trying to find out, you know, right school to go to. I tried out the Monster Factory, and uh, wasn't. I mean, I, it didn't really, you know, pique my curiosity. So I sent a letter down to the Malenko's camp. And uh, I kept in correspondence with uh, a lady there, Phil Slee. And, I mean, she's pretty much like a den mother to a lot of the wrestlers. I mean, she helped get X-Pac into the wrestling and stuff like that. And all the boys know her and, and love her dearly. And, uh, I mean, we corresponded for a little bit over six months to a year. And uh, the, the only deciding factor that then had me go to Malenko School was, you know, the co- cost of living down there was, was pretty expensive as far as, you know, Rent in the apartment down there, and then there's she brought up. Well, there's you know this other school, you know Al Snow, and I just started her- hearing of Al through uh, the newsletters and you know the videotape traders and stuff like that. That he has a school, it's the same amount of tuition, but you know the cost of living is a little bit more, you know reasonable. I mean, and I pretty much went there in blind faith. I mean, I never seen Al wrestle, or you know I I, I didn't know what to expect. I just Packed up my car and drove from Atlantic City to Lima, Ohio. <laughs> so you 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 basically just now how how old were you when you made this track? Uh, I was twenty, uh, going on twenty one, and then I, I just I graduated high school at a l- later age, and then I worked for a year and a half and saved up all my money and and then went on the uh, trek on to Al's. I mean the the road story. It's I mean the trip there is a story in itself. <laughs> I mean anything that could have went wrong in that trip did. And by the time I got to Al's and then that, I said hi, I'm looking for. Al. I was like oh hi, I'm Al and uh, I have to go right now. And he ran off because he had to get parts for the ring and stuff like that. So I'm sitting there with some of his students that you know were just almost had me walk out the door and drive back to Atlantic City. I was just, it was just Guys walking around in their gimmicks and just like you know, b- believing their gimmick. Like one guy called Pete the Pirate, he's walking around in his pirate outfit, going, Arr! I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> all righty then. <laughs> I think I'll be going now. <laughs> Any other big names training there with you? Uh, there, there's a lot. Pirate, of, Pete the Pirate. Uh, <laughs> Pete the Pirate, man. Oof. I smell money. Uh, <laughs> amongst other things, but uh, <laughs> loot. <laughs> yeah. Oh. What's it called? Um. There was a lot of there's a lot of talented people that were that were working out there at the time. Like you know, I met Pee Wee Moore there the, my first couple of days there, the referee. And there's guys like Steve Nixon, and uh, the, there's a guy who's really good on the Indies out in the Midwest right now, Jimmy V. He's uh, he trained there, and then Dan Severn was there. And uh, there's a bunch of talented guys there that you know, either you know, you know, had to give you know, couldn't handle you know, paying the bills, you know, handle their wrestling hobby, you know. Couldn't afford a wrestling hobby or just flaked out, you know. What when you st- when you started, did you give yourself like a timetable of like, or, or was or I mean, because or, or did you just go in there and like, because you know, there's so many people who go to wrestling schools and the number of those who actually like make it is like such a tiny percentage, and you wasn't know, it one in ten according to that one uh, Florida story? Oh, it's got to be way less than one. Do you would you have any idea what you think it would be? It's got to be like one in. 
75? I, I mean, mean, when I went... I don't, I don't know. I mean, what do, you, what, do you, what do you think? I mean, when I went to high school, I mean, I really had no set goals. I mean, I mean, this was, a, you know, I just a, if I do it, I do it. If I fail, I fail, and I'll just go on and, you know, flip burgers or something. I don't know. But uh, I went there. I had no set goals. I didn't go, okay, this is going to be my gimmick. I'm going to be this wrestler. I'm going to come to the ring to this music. I'm going to wear this outfit, and, and you know I'm going to be huge. You know, I'm, you know, I didn't go in there with that m mindset. I was just, you know, baby steps. I took it one step at a time. I mean, there was one guy who came in the train with Al. He hadn't even taken one bump. And hadn't even stepped through the ropes, but he had his business cards printed up, and he had the, uh, a gold. I know people like that. He has a gold plated. Uh, business card holder with his gimmick engraved into the, in the into the card holder. I'm like, uh, well, how long have you been in business? He's like, oh, I haven't even been wrestling yet. And he lasted two days and left. I mean, it was just like that MTV special they had, like true life story where that kid's saying, Aglia. He, he's like posing in the mirror, shaving. I'm going to have these eyes. I mean, there's. I mean, you run to a lot of goofs. <laughs> All the time. I mean, there's a lot of goofs in it. I mean. I mean, there's some lovable goofs that are actually successful. Then you get goofs that are just delusional. Yeah, delusional. <laughs> I mean, I mean, they already got their gimmick set. I'm gonna come out. It is. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's so weird because it's like it's like there's people who walk in and think that like I've got my gimmick now. I'm gonna be in the, now. I'm gonna be in the WWF. Teach me a few moves. Yeah, that, that's all they think it takes. I mean, nowadays I think I should should have went to the NFL. Maybe I would have got a bigger break in the business. <laughs> you know, bring me in a cross promotion, but. <laughs> I mean, uh, traditional route nowadays, but, I mean, you go into a wrestling school, you can't have that attitude. I mean, you just got to shut up and listen. And that's all I did was shut up and listen and took, you know, I mean, you also got to find the right school, too. I mean, there's a lot of places out there, oh, yeah, we'll train you, they'll take their money, and then, you know, they're off on the computer while you're in the ring. I mean, I mean, you get those goofs, too, who have their own school. I mean, you've been in the business one year and you got a wrestling school. I mean, come on, uh, please. <laughs> I want to make, make mention, as far as the Modest and Daniels thing, what their website, WCW website actually said, it did not say that they have signed. I will actually read what it says. It says, first, congratulations to Chris Daniels and Mike Modest. After breaking their backs in a tryout match and having their legs broken afterwards, both men were offered contracts with a promotion. Both have accepted and are looking forward to working for WCW. So basically that means verbal, which you know, I, I can believe that. Mm -hmm. they, they, they both wanted to go there, but... I was thinking, like, there's no way that that whole thing has been signed and all that in, in a day. It makes no sense. I remember uh, Chris... Someone says that on a website, it says, it credits me for saying that Mike Modest sustained a pinched nerve in his neck from the match. Well, it was Chris Daniels who suffered the pinched nerve in his neck. So, so anyway, that's the deal there. I remember when I first started uh, out and... says the reason the ratings are down is because okay. Steve Austin, his time has come. I don't know if Dave can hear you. Hey, Dave, can you hear Brian? Uh, <clears throat> I didn't hear him just a second ago, no. Oh, no, I was just going to put it over Chris Daniels to say uh, when I first started out, he was one of the few guys. I mean, when you ask, you know, who was, you know, breaking in when I broke in, I used to drive out to Chicago and work shows with him, and he's, a, he's an incredible talent. I'm glad he's finally, you know, doing something. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny, is a lot of people don't realize that Chris Daniels, you know, grew up in the Carolinas, actually started wrestling in Chicago. Everyone thinks of him like he's a California guy. Yeah, yeah, he's been at some shows in California. I mean, he's, he's living in California now, but yeah, I mean, that's where. I guess he must have moved there a couple of years ago. Because first I heard of him was um, as far as outside of um, Windy City wrestling. Yeah. Would have been the first I heard of you know Christopher Daniels and Kevin Quinn. That's where I met was him. Um, for Billy Anderson shows in Southern California. Yeah. Uh, a couple of wrestlers that I knew would go like you know have you ever heard of uh, the Fallen Angel and it was like no and Christopher Daniels go, yeah his name sounds familiar out of Chicago and they go he's really good this is you know probably two two three years ago. Uh, let's see. This is, someone says the reason the ratings are down is because of Steve Austin. His time has come and gone, and the only thing that made him stand out was his use of language and expletives and being an unquote badass. Uh, not to mention that he had really good matches all the time. Oh, well, the, the Rock has better promos and more fans, and is a better all-around babyface. Uh, HHH is the resident badass in the Federation nowadays. Say what you want about Austin. The fact is, if you took out Steve Austin and inserted Benoit Jericho, Van Dam, Lynn. The ratings would jump. Uh, I don't agree. We'll don't agree. Uh, Vince and Eric are ignorant to the fact that you have to give the fans what they want. Oh, they they know that. They just don't. 
you know, they just have their ideas of what the fans want. And, and also, yeah, the thing is, you've got to give the uh, the biggest segment of fans what they want. I mean, if and, if ninety, if, yeah. you know, if eight percent of the fans want to see Steve Austin and twenty uh, percent want to see Rob Van Dam, well, you're gonna get Austin. Yeah, and and and, and no one, you know. Wrestling is a weird thing. i got to tell you a story about that, about giving the fans what they want. Because I actually can say Paul Bosch, who was a great promoter in Houston for many, many years, used to kind of say that you have to give them what they want, but they don't know what they want. Because if you ask them and then deliver what they tell you, you won't draw. And he said that he once did a thing where they did something and they had like, you know, the, this is the, and they used to run like weekly in Houston. And he would have people, like like he had a thing in the, in the, in the uh, program and says, you know, fill in the match that you want. And it was whoever it was with the two top baby faces in the territory against each other. Because it was a match that, you know, they wouldn't normally book. And it's kind of like the dream match all these people had. So then he booked that match, and he drew, like, a terrible house. And then he realized that you that you have to give the fans what they want, but you can't ask them what they want. You have to tell them. Gonna, you, have to, you, have to, you have to brainwash them, there's that <laughs> word again, into wanting something and then deliver it. and Or, or, or um, sell them on it or whatever word you want to use. But... Um, it, 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 it's not a, um, it's not simple. It's not a simple science. If it was, um, people would be making more. People would be making money in wrestling. But um, anyway, it says um, if, if they if they had listened instead of Haku, the surprise would have been Rob Van Dam or Jerry Lynn. Imagine what type of ratings Eric would do if he announced a Rob Van Dam versus Jerry Lynn match to go up against the star of Raw. If we just threw Rob Van Dam and Jerry Lynn in Monday night in do um, one three like it did on TNN. Well, do well not people. that low, but. No, it would do, do a, it'd do a one nine. Yeah, I mean realistically, I mean it's, it's you, you've got to build people up to wanting it. You can't just you can't just throw things out there cold. You got you got. I mean you can present like like what they remember when they did the uh, Goldberg Scott Steiner cage match at uh, mm-hmm. Nassau Coliseum I think it was. Yeah, and it did it like a two point two rating because they they did no build up. I mean you you have to if you have a match Goldberg Scott Steiner cage match should have been a real big deal in WCW, but you got to make people want it. Hold it back, hype them on it, and then deliver it when they want it, rather than give it to them before they even know they want it, because then they don't, then it doesn't even have any reaction. It's a real, it's it's not easy. Sometimes I think it's not that difficult, but it's also not that easy either. I mean, got, it's made. I think sometimes it's made more difficult because people, when they get in a room, they think too much. Exactly like like, I've like goofed around with people in WCW, and we start on like ideas, okay. And usually the ideas in the first five minutes are really good because about 25 minutes in, we're like adding layers to these ideas that are making us laugh. And you know what? It sucks best nitro. It really would really, because and, and, you know you know what I mean. So anyway, that's that's my speech on that. Um, now, um, let's let's go through here. Um, Brian, as far as um, do you have like right now as far as uh. If ECW doesn't make it, kind of a backup plan and kind of like what, just kind of hoping, working that next pay-per-view and things like that, waiting for the next pay-per-view, or what's, kind of what's your mindset on everything right now? I mean, in a perfect world, I really want, you know, the next pay-per-view to come around and, uh, you know, ECW sign everything and everybody be happy and, you know, make money. But, uh, yeah, I do have a lot of uh, extracurricular ideas I'm thinking of. Uh, right now we're talk- in talks with the... Uh, Mark, Mike Shank and all them about uh, the people who did the movie American Movie. They want us to be in their uh, sequel movie. Yeah. It's no title yet, but starting at maybe around February or March. And then you know Jasmine's always got her modeling and stuff like that, yeah. and doing fashion layouts and doing the appearances and indie work. But uh, you know you always weigh these options out. You always you know look you know you know two miles down the road and see what happens. But right now, I mean. I have always had the option of, you know, the uh, mentality of, you know, I'll land on my feet somehow, somewhere, and, you know, I'll ride the wave where it takes me. You know, if right now I'm hoping things work with ECW. If they don't, then, you know, I already have a few ideas of what I'd like to do. Yeah. Are, are, are you, as far as, like, your wrestling career, are you pretty much, did you think, do you think it would get this, even, did you think it would get this far, or did you just kind of take it and this is where it's at? Like, like when you first started, did you really know what you were getting into, and was, you know what I mean? When you, especially like, like when you first got to the WWF, did you kind of like go, "Wow, I never thought I'd make it here," or was it one of those things where you did think you would make it there? 
I never thought I'd get past wrestling school. I mean, this, this stuff I was going through, and you know, your body starts aching, you go, you know, the slightest thing, you go, oh, that hurts. But I mean, then your body gets used to it, and then you start getting your cardio up, and it actually starts becoming fun. And I never thought I'd get, even get it into ECW. I mean, I got ECW my first uh, ten months in the business, probably, and I mean, I never even expected to get that far. I mean, and then you get to the WWF and you're waiting in a gorilla position and you step out on the, the Raw stage and you're just like, wow. And you see all the folks. I mean, you're used to wrestling, you know, in Jim Thorpe in front of 200 people. And then you go to, you know, the first union center in Philadelphia. And it's, I mean, it's amazing. You know, I, I'm just grateful for everything that's come my way and every opportunity I've had because basically I shouldn't be here right now. You know, looking were you ever, at. Were you intimidated by, like, the first time you stepped out in front of like a crowd of ten thousand people or fifteen thousand people. Oh yeah, I mean my heart was up in my throat pounding. Uh, it's just, yeah, you know, I mean if somebody says they don't get nervous, they're you know they're lying. I mean you get those pre-match jer jitters and all that stuff, but I mean when when you see everything that goes into it and it's it's a real a real big deal. I mean you, and you step out there and there's ten thousand people looking at you at the very exact same time. I mean it's an incredible rush. I mean. I might be Brian in the girl position, but I'm definitely somebody else when I walk through the curtain. For both of you guys, when, um, I mean, you know, Jasmine, you mentioned some of the women wrestlers that yeah. you liked when you were. Uh, I, I love, and, yeah, I, I, mean, I totally admire them. Men wrestlers that you liked, and Brian, I mean, were they of any course, good wrestlers? Of course. I was a very. You big... watching wrestling where, you know, they like, were like your favorites or something like yeah, that. Yeah, Jimmy Snuka. Um, who else did I like? I liked The Ultimate Warrior. I actually had a crush on him, but I thought he was phenomenal. Hulk Hogan. Um, I like a lot of the Japanese wrestlers, too. I wasn't sure of the names because the names are just so just difficult to pronounce. <laughs> it just felt really different. Um, but those are my favorites. I like Hulk. I like The Ultimate Warrior. I like Snuka. Uh, I love The Rockers. The Rockers. Yeah. <laughs> Rick Martel. Brutus Beefcake Barber. Who else? Uh, Playboy. Playboy Buddy Rose? Yeah. Oh, Buddy Rose. It was Rose. a lot of fun to watch. <laughs> Buddy That's Rose was a very talented man. He was. He was very yeah. entertaining. He's very incredible. I yeah. Mean, we, we just, I just pulled out an old tip of Buddy Rose versus Bob Acklin. From oh, yeah. That, it was just a lot of Buddy Rose stuff on there. I also like King Kong Bundy. Sherry Martell, didn't Sherry Martell start with Buddy Rose? Yeah, yeah she, she was his valet at the time she used to uh, comb his hair. She was actually in the tape that we watched, and yeah. I actually had the honor of meeting her this past summer back in July in Milwaukee. We worked a mixed tag match with her, and she is one of the nicest women in this business that I've ever met. Okay, um, I guess we are totally out of time right now. Yeah. I want to thank you two guys for dropping by. Thank you. Thanks and for having Brian, us. Brian, of course, uh, for being here. And tomorrow we're going to have... Bruno San Martino, so it should be quite an interesting show, and we'll see everybody tomorrow at 5.